Hello, everyone. It's my privilege today to talk to you about the responsible consumption of open source. And my slides aren't up yet. Can somebody bring my slides up? Perfect. Thank you. All right. So first, we're going to start with what is open source software? So to me, open source software is a beautiful thing. It is capturing the world's creative freedom as code. In practice, what that means is smart people around the world collaborating and writing software. This software is then open for all to see, all to contribute to, and all to use. Now, more specifically, right, there are some criteria to officially be considered open source. So the software must be free to be redistributed. So one of the tenets of open source is creativity and empowerment for any and everyone. So the software must be free. Anyone can leverage and utilize open source. The source is available with so software. So if you build open source software, the source code associated with that, essentially what's happening behind the scenes, needs to be available. So someone running your software has the ability to look. Transparency is a huge tenet of open source. Derived work is allowed. So that means you can start with something that's open source and you can build on top of it. You may derive your own collective innovation from something that starts in open source. The integrity of the author source code is maintained. So um, it contains no discrimination against people or groups, right? It's, it's collective innovation and it's supposed to be about empowering anyone and everyone with this innovation. So another one around no discrimination about any fields or endeavors. The license must be distributed with, this, with the source code. The license must not be specific to a product. So again, open source is about freedom. It is not tying you into a particular use case. It is not tying you into a specific product. It's not restricted. It doesn't restrict other software. So open source can't say you cannot use this open source with this other piece of software. It is quite literally freedom of software. And the license must be technology neutral. So again, going back to the open source can't specifically only work on one particular thing, right? That's not the collective innovation and freedom of the world. So there are two common types of open source and it's two different ways to consume it. So frameworks and libraries, you can think of this as a piece of code that serves a specific purpose. So take, for example, a graphing library or communications library. It's meant to be a part of something bigger. Standalone, it doesn't necessarily have the ability to be its own solution, right? It is a piece that goes into something bigger. And then you have solutions. So these are the pieces of software that can be standalone, right? They are something that perform a function or behavior. So in this case, think about something like a game or a chat program. It's something that you could use standalone. But what's the scale of open source? So this all sounds really interesting, but are you talking about something that's sort of growing in popularity? How prevalent is it? So I'm here to tell you that open source is immensely prevalent. So if you're a leader inside of a company that writes software, I feel incredibly confident in saying that open source is probably used inside of your company, whether or not you know it. So it is estimated that 96% of software code bases in the world use open source inside of them. And that when you look at commercial applications, so think proprietary things that customer or some companies sell, that there can be up to 99.9% .9 open source in those. And that might seem really strange. You might think, well, what's the point of selling a piece of software that's predominantly open source? But let me use an example. So think of a medical device. Let's think of one whose clinical function is to deliver a certain amount of drug to a patient. The amount of drug to deliver, when to deliver it, the rate to deliver it, that's the core function of the medical device, right? That's the thing that the medical device manufacturer has spent a tremendous amount of R&D developing. But the device needs to talk on the network. It needs to respond to button presses. It needs to draw things on a screen. All of these are adjacent to its clinical function. So why would a medical device manufacturer spending time rewriting fundamental things like a graphing library or libraries that respond to a button press? 
These are exact types of situations where open source is really useful. And so when you see these really high prevalence of open source and software, it doesn't mean that the manufacturers were lazy. It means that there was something that was core, that was innovative, that their specialty is. And then for the pieces adjacent to that that are simply needed to deliver that final product, they then leverage open source. So what's the value of open source, right? Open source, I mentioned, it's free. It's free to be consumed. So how is there value associated with it? Well, a bunch of studies have been done and a really interesting one from Harvard came out uh, just a couple months ago. And what they did was they assessed the usage of open source in software. And then they determined that the supply side value of widely used open source software is 4 billion annually. So the supply side means of the libraries that are getting consumed, right, that it would have cost they think about $4 billion for someone to have produced just those commonly used open source libraries if they hadn't been done in the open source space. The demand side value is $8 trillion. So this means that for companies who are consuming open source libraries, if you were to think about the commercial versions of those, that if they were to have paid for the value that they were getting from that open source, that it would have been approximately $8 trillion in value achieved by leveraging open source. And that just at large, companies would need to spend three and a half times more money on the software they develop if they were not able to leverage the open source. So why use open source, right? It sounds wonderful, right? This collective innovation, it's free to use, it's wonderful, it's prevalent. So why use it, right? There are lots of different ways or reasons to use open source. So I mentioned early on that one of the tenets of open source is transparency of implementation, right? I'm a big believer that trust comes from truth and that truth is my ability to introspect on the code that is running on my system. And that open source, because it is freely available and open, you have the ability to look at that and make a decision on whether or not you choose to trust that code. It increases the productivity of application development through things like open standards, standards or interoperability. Because again, open source is about that freedom. It's not about one particular, op, or it's not one particular software stack, or it's not one particular vendor. It's about this interoperability in software that can just work at certain levels and, and interact with other open source software. I've mentioned before and numerous times, because this is one of my favorite aspects of open source, is that it supports open collaboration and innovation. You can see, and I love seeing, developers from, that work during the day in companies that would traditionally be considered competitors collaborating collectively on something that is just innovation for the world. It's really quite amazing. It also minimizes vendor lock-in. So part of open source, right, because there's no contractual obligation to continue to leverage it, it also lets you kind of try things. Right? I can try one graphing library, and if I decide I don't like it, there's not a bunch of MSAs for me to renegotiate. I can go try another open source one. So a lot of people appreciate and like the ability to pivot or to try out different pieces of software without having to go through the lock-in. It can facilitate the early adoption of emerging technologies. So because you have so many incredibly intelligent people across the world contributing to open source, what you find is open source is some of the early places to find really emerging technology. So in my past role, I, I worked at Intel, and one of the pieces of technology I worked on was confidential computing. So I can tell you some of the early libraries and code we saw around that could leverage this new capability called confidential computing was in the open source space. So this early adoption of emerging technology, if you want to be on the cutting edge and using some of these really innovative things, open source is often one of the first areas that you'll find it. And then, of course, there's a potential for cost reduction. Because open source itself is free, obviously there's no cost associated with direct usage or downloading of the open source software. So if there's some proprietary tooling that you may be paying for now, if there's an open source alternative to it, right, there's a potential to reduce some of your overall costs. Going back to that Harvard study suggesting that there's $8 trillion right, in value to be achieved from these common open source libraries. Okay, so this all sounds great. But can it be enterprise ready? The truth is, yes. There are lots of open source that is enterprise grade. So what do I mean by enterprise grade? So enterprise grade to me means it is software that supports many of the same feature functionality and support that you would get in proprietary software. So it means offering engineering and help, help and support. 
It means robust and timely patching. It means mature feature roadmaps and timelines, so the ability to see, you know, this feature is coming in six months. Robust and well-tested. And long-term support. So things that have a guaranteed support and patching timeline of five to 10 and sometimes more. But not all open source is created equal. So I just said there's all these really amazing things. What I want you to understand is not all open source is enterprise ready, right? Not all open source is robust. And so this is where part of my talk is empowering you to understand how to responsibly consume open source. So when you're considering the adoption of open source, there's a lot of really important questions that you need to be intentional about. I mentioned earlier that if you're a company that writes software, I feel really confident saying open source is already being used inside of your environment. So if you've not decided to be intentional and develop an open source strategy, then that open source is being used without a consideration for your potential risk tolerance for it. And so what I want to do is empower you with these are the questions you need to go back and intentionally make decisions on. And these are the things that will dictate appropriate and responsible consumption of open source. So one of the first things you need to understand is, is it supported? And do you need support? I mentioned that enterprise readiness and that some of open source companies out there, right, they develop open source and actually their business model is that they monetize the support on top of that. But not also if open source is that way. So when consuming open source, you have to make the decision. Do I only want to consume open source that has support behind it? Should I need it? I don't know. That's your decision to make. Is it appropriate for the business need? Right. I mentioned some of these libraries are more robust, resilient. They've been tested. They have support. Right. They have enterprise levels, SLAs. They have patching timelines. Depending on what your business need is, those things should be really important to you. If you're using this in a critical core business function, then I would suggest that you need to use open source software that has timely patching, guaranteed patching, timelines associated with feature functionality and improvements, timely communication. If you are testing out a really novel cutting edge piece of technology on a development board, I would then favor innovation and not necessarily enterprise readiness yet. But the point is that needs to be a decision that is made. Is it appropriate for your, your business name? So do you favor stability or cutting edge? And again, this isn't necessarily a business wide decision, but it is a use case decision. So depending on how you're going to use the open source, is stability more important than the most cutting edge feature functionality? So what type of license are you okay with? So I won't dig into it in this presentation, but open source comes with a number of various licenses associated with it. And depending on the license type, it can dictate how derived work is done. So if I want to take a piece of open source software and I want to leverage it inside of my proprietary solution that I do not intend to open source, there are certain license types that do allow this. It is possible. But the point is that you need to be intentional in making sure that you're choosing the correct license types and that you're using them correctly so that that license holds. So the next one, are you using that license correctly? So I do see people in the open source community who want to leverage open source, but then they use it incorrectly and they violate the license type associated with it. And what you don't want to have happen is have something like uh, your software that you intended to be proprietary, not open source, but because you use an open source library incorrectly, you are now obligated to open source a piece of your proprietary code. So as I said, it is possible for you to have your proprietary code, but you need to make sure you're using the license incorrectly. So how do you responsibly consume it? So you need to understand the unique nuances and values associated with open source. So all of the things that I just talked about. So you need to create what I'm suggesting is create an open source internal strategy and policy. So every single company that works in software development should have one of these. It should very clearly dictate what types of license types you're okay with and the use case you are okay with those particular license types. How must the open source be used, right? Can it be used for internal projects, R&D? Can it be in final delivered products? What type of support must be offered? Are you okay with the type of open source library that offers only enterprise level support? Or are you okay with the libraries that have no support other than simply just community best effort? And what level of community of activity is acceptable? So some open source libraries, while they're really powerful, they have been, somebody had a really good idea, they wrote it, they put it out in the world, and then they sort of abandon it. So while the thing may be really useful, it's not going to continue to improve. There's going to be no new feature functionality unless others kind of show up and pick up the gauntlet. And sometimes that does happen, right? That's some of the beauty of open source, but also sometimes these libraries get abandoned. So if you're putting some capability into something you intend to support for the next 10 or 12 years, 
do you want to make sure that there's enough community around that piece of open source that it's still going to be supported? So I want to give a great example of an open source strategy that the Center for Medicare and Medicaid came out with recently. So if you go to their website and you search for open source solutions, you can see a really intentional strategy that they put together. For, so for those of you who are thinking like, where should I start, right? How do I make my own open source strategy? I would recommend you read through this Medicare and Medicaid one. It's publicly available. And they really did think through all of these different scenarios to outline essentially when could open source be used in their internal development, what type of licenses, and in what situations was it okay to use this so they could be intentional about their open source. So the next thing is, now you need to apply your mindset. So I've helped you understand what open source is, the prevalence of it, why people like to use it, and what you need to be concerned about if you're going to responsibly consume open source. So now you have to apply that new mindset. So to do that, you need to understand the unique value and nuances of open source. While I have wonderful and amazing things to say about open source, it still goes back to some of those unique nuances that not every piece of open source is created equal. Some of it is well supported. Some of it is well documented. Some of it has support timelines. Some of them have enterprise ready uh, support and, and things that you can hire and pay for. And some of them don't, right? Some of them are a teenager and his computer who had a great idea. And that's wonderful, right? Innovation comes in all forms and functions. But the point is you need to understand that is a unique nuance of open source. You should also go back and identify the existing use of open source in your organization. If you don't already have an open source strategy, I'm still gonna propose that you're already using it. And so to get a hold, of the risk that you might currently be under, you need to also kind of double down and double click and understand where are you already using open source, whether it's inside of your internal infrastructure, whether it's inside of the commercial products that you sell, open source is probably somewhere in there. And so you should be aware and knowledgeable about where that open source is, what type of the open source it is and how it's being used. You need to identify software opportunities then that could leverage open source, right? Hopefully I've told you that there's a really great value proposition to using open source. And while I offered six different sort of value propositions, some of them likely resonate better with others, right? Some are looking for that cost savings, some are looking for that just cutting edge innovation, and some are looking to be able to just try all sorts of different things without having to renegotiate vendor contracts. There are lots of different reasons. Looking internally at your current software needs and trying to identify where are the opportunities that open source could be really useful. Now, I will be the first to say that not every business use case has an enterprise ready viable open source. But again, that goes back to making that intentional decision of what is open source acceptable to you? Right? Are you okay with unsupported but really novel pieces of open source? And maybe you are. And then you should establish an open source policy. Be intentional, intentional about your position on acceptable use. What is your criteria for evaluation? What are the use cases that you are okay with using open source? And most specifically, also make sure you're engaging with your legal team or outside counsel to understand what license types can be used. Because again, I didn't get a chance to dig into license types, but license types are a really important aspect of using open source and making sure that you're finding the right license type that meets the need and how you're trying to consume the open source. And then use that to determine your path to a responsible adoption about open source software. And with that, I am done.